Happy Mother's Day. We want to give a big shout out to all of our moms. We love you, we appreciate you, and we look forward to seeing many of you today at noon as we gather here in the church parking lot for our Mother's Day celebration. We will maintain social distancing. We have gifts for all of the ladies. Don't forget that you need to bring your own lunch and lawn chairs. And I'm looking forward to seeing many of you and reconnecting and just having a really good time as we get together today. Last week, we posted a survey online on our Facebook page, Instagram, and the church website. And this survey is designed for us, first of all, to find out how you're doing during this time and how we can help you. But secondly, we want to get your input as we're looking at reopening and just what are some things we need to consider. So the more uh, input we can get from you, the better it can help us so that we can reopen in the best way possible. Please fill out that survey if you haven't done so already. If you're joining us new this morning, we're in the middle of a series that's called Real Life where we're talking about what really matters in life, what are the essentials. Many people during this COVID-19 pandemic are finding what is the essentials, what are the essentials, what are the basics of life. They're, they're getting back to the things that are most important. For example, they're taking more time for family. They're, they're sitting down for a family dinner around the table and just enjoying one another's company. Many parents are finding that they can have some critical conversations with their kids and they don't have to rush off and go do the next thing. So it's really opening up some, some great communication about some topics that maybe they wouldn't normally talk about. This whole situation of many things being shut down, closed down, has forced us to slow down our own lives and find the things that really matter. Many of us are having more time to, to spend in prayer or to read God's Word. And my prayer is that hopefully these things will continue even once we go back to the way things were or the new normal, when we get back to the normal activities of life, that these essentials, these important things will not just kind of fall by the wayside, but will keep them front and center. What we've been doing the last few weeks is we've been looking at some of the essentials of the Christian life that the Apostle Paul talks about in the book of Colossians. There were many false teachers that came through the, the city of Colossae where the church was, and they'd been told things that were wrong, that were inaccurate about who God was or how to live your life. And Paul corrected those errors. And in Colossians chapter 2, he deals with them, he lays them out, and then in chapters 3 and 4, he says, hey, Christians, followers of Jesus, this is what the real Christian life is all about. This is what real life in Christ is all about. And we have been looking at the real life for these past few weeks. And in Colossians, Paul deals with four relationships that really make up the Christian life. And as we've noted the past few weeks, that relationships just are not with people. There's other aspects. A relationship is a connection, an association, or involvement with anyone or anything. And there are four relationships Paul deals with. And when you think of it, these four relationships, everything in life kind of, kind of fall under the umbrella of these four relationships. Also, many times they kind of overlap in the different areas. The first relationship is our relationship with sin. There's also the relationship with the world, our relationship with God, and then our relationship with people. And we have developed an acrostic to help us remember these four relationships. That word is the word real, R-E-A-L. And in week one, we looked at the letter R, which stands for righteous, which deals with our relationship with sin. When you and I become Christians, not only are we forgiven, not only does Jesus take our sin away, but Christ gives us his righteousness. His righteousness is given to us so when God looks at us, he sees us as being perfect and sinless just as he sees Jesus. We are given a new nature, 
a, a new life, a new identity. And Paul said in Colossians, you need to put on this new nature. Just as you put on a, a, an outfit of clothing, you have to make a deliberate choice to put on this new nature, this new identity, so that you can live in the real life. You're not living in the former life. You don't do things the way you used to. You are now righteous in Christ, and that deals with our relationship to sin. The letter E in the word real stands for eternity purposed. Eternity purposed, and that deals with our relationship with the world. We are not created for this world. You and I, we were created for heaven. God has created us for eternity. He wants us to spend eternity with Him. John 3, 16, we looked at God's purpose. He loves the world so much that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life, a life in eternity with God. And that's our purpose. God has designed us that we should have eternal life, but then also that we share eternal life with everyone else. And it's so easy for us to get caught up with the things of this world and we live for the things of this world. We live for money. We live for popularity. We live for accomplishments and accumulation of stuff. But none of those things satisfy. Only a relationship with God satisfies. And we need to use the things of this world to accomplish eternal purposes, which is all people would come to know God and have eternal life and they wouldn't perish. And so God asks us to use the things of this world, our time, our talent, our treasure for eternity and not for the temporal enjoyment of this world. It's for God's pleasure and not our own. Um, this morning we're going to look at the next letter in our acrostic of the word real, the letter A, and that stands for adore God. We need to adore God and this deals with our relationship with God. Our relationship with God. The word adore means to regard with the utmost esteem, love, and respect. It means to honor. When I was growing up in high school, many of my friends went to church every week. And if you'd ask them, are you a Christian? They would probably respond, yeah, I'm a Christian. However, as you looked at their life for the rest of the week, uh, you really wouldn't think they were Christians. You wouldn't think that God even maybe existed because they lived life like God didn't exist. They thought about God for an hour or so on Sunday morning, but the rest of the week, the way they treated people, the way they spoke, the way they, they acted, their values, their decisions, did not reflect a relationship with God. Because when you have a relationship with someone, it influences how you live. They had religion, but they didn't have relationship. This past week, my wife Rebecca and I, we celebrated our 30th anniversary. All right, you can go ahead and clap, all right? Because I know if you were here in this building right now, as I'm preaching, you would be clapping that we had our 30th. So just go ahead and clap right now. All right, you got it? You're good? This week, we celebrate our 30th anniversary and it's been a wonderful 30 years. Not everything's been perfect, but I can say I love my wife today more than I did 30 years ago. And we have a close, loving relationship because I have gotten to know her. I have a relationship, and that relationship influences how I live. For example, I am faithful to my wife because we have relationship. I'm faithful to her physically. She's the only woman that I've ever been intimate with. I'm faithful to her mentally. I don't lust over other women. I don't look at pornography. Now, that doesn't mean I'm tempted. I'm tempted as much as anyone else. I just have to resist those temptations and fight against them. I also am faithful emotionally, where I don't flirt with other women. I don't go out with other women, go to lunch with them or do things alone with them. I want to safeguard my relationship with my wife because I have a relationship with her. It influences how I live. We spend time together. We talk together. We do a regular date night every week. We have um, done date night every, ever since we've been married for, for starting 30 years ago. 
Well, there was a time when we weren't doing so well financially. We couldn't do it every week, but we made sure we could do it every other week because we wanted to connect with each other because of that relationship and influenced how we spent our money, how we spent our time. It influenced how we live. And in everything, I want to serve my wife. I want to help my wife. That influences how I live. I want to honor my wife. Just a couple of weeks ago, I went golfing with one of the members of our church, and we were paired with a couple of other guys. And don't worry, we kept the social distancing thing down. We had that down. But near the end of the round, one of the other guys made a snide comment, a snide remark about his wife in the bedroom. And when he said that, I just kind of cringed. It's like, oh, man, don't do that to your marriage. Don't do that to your wife. I, there's no way that I want to speak disparagingly of my wife because I love her. See, when you have a relationship with someone, it influences how you live. So the question I have for you this morning is, how does your relationship with Christ influence how you live? Does it influence your speech? Does it influence how you serve? Does it influence your time, your talent, your treasure? You say, Craig, this kind of sounds like you're hitting on eternity's purpose, what we talked about last week. Remember, I mentioned a little bit ago that our, th th these things all take place. They impact, uh, they overlap one another. So this morning, we want to talk about our relationship with God. Jesus said, as he was teaching about what the greatest commandment was in Matthew 22, verse 37 and 38, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. If we love God, Jesus is saying it should permeate our entire being, heart, soul, mind. It's not like, well, God, I'm going to give you a little bit right here, but I'm going to keep all the rest of this for me. No, when you love God, you love Him with everything, with your all, to the very core of your being. That is a love relationship with God. We adore God. We esteem Him to the utmost. We love Him. We respect Him. We, uh, we uh, honor Him, and it influences how we live. There may be some of you here, you don't have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you were religious like my friends were in school. They went to church, but it really didn't impact their lives. And you know God speaking to you, saying, you need a relationship with me. And just a few minutes from now, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. But what I want to do in the time we have remaining is talk about how do we grow in this relationship? Because you see, a relationship with God isn't just like, hi, God, I love you, and then you'll move on and go on with the rest of your life. Our relationship with God should be growing. And here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul gives us three ways that we grow in our adoration and love for God. So if you're taking notes this morning, you can write these down. And by the way, they all begin with the letter W, so you can kind of look for that. The first way we grow in our love and adoration for God is that we need to be worshipers. You need to be a worshiper. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, at the end of the verse it says, Be thankful, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, we're going to keep this slide up here a little bit because I want you to do a little detective work. In, this, in these three verses, Paul mentions one word three times. Now, don't look for conjunctions or pronouns or prepositions, but what word does Paul use three times? Have you found it? You got the word? It's the word thanks or thankful. He says at the end of verse 15, always be thankful. At the end of verse 16, sing spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. At the end of 17, giving thanks through him to God the Father. He also says at a fourth time in chapter 4, verse 2, a person who adores God is going to be a worshiper and they're going to be thankful. 
Satan, the devil, he was unthankful. He was the highest created being in all of heaven. No being was higher than him. He was the most powerful angel. He was also the worship leader in heaven. But what happened is that Satan became unthankful. He was discontent with how God created him, with all that God had given him. And when he began to focus on what he didn't have instead of what he had, when he became discontent and he lost that heart of thanksgiving, he stopped leading worship and he led a rebellion. And as a result, Satan was kicked out of heaven, he lost his destiny, and he is destined now for destruction. And this is what happens to you and I. When you and I, when we lose our spirit of thanksgiving, when we become disgruntled and we're blaming God for what's happened in our lives, we are in danger of forfeiting our destiny. We lose our identity. And if we continue in this heart of ingratitude, it can turn into a heart of bitterness and a heart of rebellion, and it leads us away from God. I've seen many people in life, when something has gone bad in their life, they begin to focus on the negative instead of all the good things God has done. And as a result, they eventually fall away from Christ because they are ungrateful for what Jesus has done for them. And friends, some of you may be in danger of doing that same thing. You are on a path of ingratitude. Maybe you lost your job or you've lost income. You've lost something during this time of COVID-19. Or maybe there's a different crisis, a different problem taking place in your life. And as you've experienced loss, you, you find yourself getting a little upset with God. You're complaining, you're grumbling, you're unthankful, and instead of worshiping God, you've been whining God, and this negativity, if you let it go on, can turn your heart away from God and you'll walk away from Him. Don't let the devil do that to you because that's his tactic. That's what he did. And when you walk that same road, you end up just like him. You lose your destiny and you find you will end up in destruction. The Apostle Paul, he had many reasons not to give thanks, not to praise God, not to worship God. When he wrote Colossians, he was actually in prison. He was in chains. He didn't have his freedom, and yet four times he says, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. When Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was in prison. He says in chapter 5, verse 3, that it is fitting for Christians to, to be thankful. In verse 19 and 20, he says, and if you compare this to Colossians 3.16, they echo one another. They're eerily similar. He says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things. I'm giving thanks. I'm in prison. God wants you to give thanks. You might feel like you're in a prison this morning. You might feel isolated. Give thanks. You feel like you've lost something. You might feel like life is hopeless. Give thanks in everything because God works everything to good to those who love Him, to those who have a relationship with Him. Don't give up. Praise God in this time. Paul wrote the book of Philippians in prison. And 16 times he uses the word joy or rejoice. In Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Okay, he said to say it again, so you say it now. Say rejoice. Rejoice in everything. In verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious about the circumstance you're going through, about the loss of income, the loss of a job, about whatever might be taking place in your life that's affecting you adversely, don't be anxious about it, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Friends, this morning, you have a choice to make. In your situation, whether you're on a mountaintop or whether you're down in a valley, whether you're in a, in a pit, in a prison, or whether you're up in a palace, whatever life is doing, you have a choice. Are you going to focus on what God has done for you? Will you be thankful? You say, man, I don't know how to do that. 
what you do is you get up in the morning and you start with the first thing in front of you. You wake up and it's like, God, I had a good night's sleep. I could sleep last night. I thank you that I slept. God, I had a bed to sleep in. I had a pillow to put my head on. I thank you for that. You go take a shower. Thank God for running water. Thank God for hot water. Thank God that you have soap, that you have your body, that you can move your body, that you're active this morning, you're alive. When you go to brush your teeth, you can thank God that you've got teeth. You say, well, I don't have teeth, i got false teeth. Well, you can thank God that the technology's come along, that you've got false teeth, so you wouldn't be gumming everybody. When you go to the kitchen and you pull out the clean bowl from the dishwasher, if you have a dishwasher, thank God for the dishwasher. Thank God for the electricity that ran the dishwasher. When you put food in the bowl or on the plate or whatever you do, thank God for the food that he's given you. Thank God for everything that takes place in your life. As you look at the different events that you go through the day and you begin to look at, God gave me this. God's blessed me with that. God has pr protected me. He's preserved me here. God will help you develop a heart of thanksgiving and worship. Be a worshiper. That's the first way that you and I grow in our adoration for God. The second thing Paul talks about, the second way we grow in our love relationship with God is to be in the Word. We need to be in God's Word. Let's look back at Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 to 17. And as we do, I want you to notice what is sandwiched between the two parts of, uh, at the beginning and the end of praising and thanking God. He's going to talk about praising and thanking God in the beginning at the end. Look what's in the middle. It says, always be thankful. We're at the end of verse 15. He says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. What is sandwiched in between there? It's the word of God. He says the message about Christ. Where do you hear the message about Christ? It's in the Bible. He says teach and counsel with wisdom. Where do we get the wisdom? How, where do we get it to teach and counsel? We get it from the Bible. We need to be people that are in the Word of God. God's Word is like the meat in the sandwich. It's the spiritual protein. God's Word builds spiritual muscles. It makes us strong. God's Word makes you stronger in worship. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Real worship is based on truth. It's based on the Word of God. The more you and I get truth into our hearts, the more it's going to help us to worship God, the easier it is to worship God. For our 30th anniversary, I took my wife to Cancun in February. Now, I know my wife. I know that my wife does not like cold weather. She doesn't like snow. And because of that, I'm not going to take her to Jackson or someplace in Colorado to a ski resort to go skiing where there's a ton of snow. She would not like that. I'm not going to take her on an Alaskan cruise because that's too chilly. She likes it warm. She likes the sun, the blue skies, the beaches, the palm trees. That's what my wife likes. So that's where I took her. The point I'm making is that because I know what my wife likes, I can love her better. If I would have taken her to a ski resort or on a cold cruise, she'd be shivering. She wouldn't enjoy it. That wouldn't please her. But when I took her to the warm, sunny beaches, oh man, she loved it. It was great. Also, I know that she gets tired of the long winters here in Wyoming. It's a drain on her. So instead of waiting till May to go to the beach, I took her in February, and I didn't mind getting out of the cold weather either. You see, because I know my wife and what she likes, that gives me the ability to love her better. And the more knowledge you and I have, increasing our knowledge increases our ability to love. I'm going to say that again. Increasing 
your knowledge, increasing my knowledge, increases our ability to love. And that's why filling our lives with God's Word is so vitally important. Because as you gain more knowledge of God, it increases your ability to love Him better. As you find out what God desires, what God wants, what pleases God, then you can do those things and grow in your love for Him. That's how you love Him. Also, the more you know about God, the more you love Him, the more you see how great and wonderful He is. I knew my wife was great 30 years ago, but now, after putting up with me for 30 years, I really understand how great she is. The more knowledge I've gained about her, I love her all the more. And that's what God wants us to do. As we grow in our knowledge, we can love Him more. Now, what's sad is that many times in the Bible, we can see where people, instead of growing in their knowledge of God, when they received knowledge of God, what God wanted, they rejected that knowledge. They rejected God's Word. They despised His commandments. I want to look at one portion of Scripture today that illustrates what happens when you and I reject God's Word. Isaiah chapter 30, starting in verse 10. Isaiah says, You who say to the prophets, the prophets were the speak people that spoke God's message, You who say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us the right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. You see, the Hebrews did not want God's message. The Jews were rejecting God's message. They would rather settle for falsehoods, things that were smooth and easy on them, things that didn't convict them, things that didn't require commitment or sacrifice to God. That's what they wanted, and because of that, Verse 12, it says, This is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message of God's counsel, because you've relied on oppression and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall. And Isaiah is painting a picture. I want you to imagine a picture here of a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly, in an instant, without warning. And this wall, it will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces, not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of the cistern. Isaiah was saying this wall is going to be destroyed so completely, so entirely, that there's not going to be a piece big enough that you can reach into a fire. If you've ever been camping and you see the embers of a fire, you know how you could maybe put a little shovel in or a piece of bark and pick up an ember? And Isaiah says there's not going to be even a piece of the wall big enough that you can pick up an ember from the fire. There's not like a piece that you could use as a, as a cup if it's kind of hollowed out to use it as a cup from a well to get a drink of water. The point Isaiah is making is that your life is broken and useless when you reject God's Word. When we disobey God, when we will not listen to Him, when we refuse Him, our life is broken. Our life is useless. That's why we need to be people who are filling our lives with the Word of God. And it's not just reading it. We need to love it. This past week, I was reading in my devotions and I came to Luke chapter 24, And it was the story of the two disciples after Jesus had died. They were on their way to Emmaus, and they were talking about how Jesus has died. What are we going to do? And Jesus shows up to them unknowingly, and they say, Man, didn't you know Jesus died? And Jesus begins to explain to them from the Scriptures, from the Law and the Prophets, showing them how the Messiah had to die. And when they finally come to their senses and they realize it is Jesus, they say in verse 32, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And when I read that verse, I began to pray. I said, God, I just don't want to read your word to say that I've done it, to check it off my to-do list. I don't want to make it a mental exercise. Jesus, I want you to explain the scriptures to me so that my heart burns, so that the Word becomes alive, so that it's living and powerful and makes an impact in me. 
And that, I begin to pray that for us, for our church, that we would become people who love the Word, that when we read it, God's Word would begin to, to burn inside of us. We would ask God when we, when we begin to read it, say, God, reveal yourself to me. Show me what you want. Jesus, uh, reveal your Word and let it burn in me. When we become people who are filled with the Word, and during this time of COVID-19, Many of us have extra time on our hands, and so we find ourselves filling that time with something. Maybe you're spending a whole lot more time on Facebook or reading about COVID-19 going to all of the sites. Maybe you're filling your mind with, with Hulu or with Netflix or some other streaming service, watching a lot of movies or binge-watching a TV series. Some of you, maybe you students, may be uh, binging on video games and doing a lot of other things. In this time, make sure you're filling yourself with the Word of God. This is not a time to go less on God's Word. This is a time to go more. What we fill our hearts and minds with will make a difference. Be a person who loves God's Word and fills their lives with it. So how do we grow in our adoration of God? First, we need to be worshipers. Secondly, we need to be in the Word. Number three, we need to be warriors in prayer. You need to be a warrior in prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. There's that thanksgiving again. Now, I want us just to look at this verse, and there's three words I want to break down. The first word is devote. The word devote means to persevere in. When we devote ourselves to prayer, that means we don't quit. We keep on praying. Even if we're in a prison, in a negative situation like Paul was, Paul says, hey, don't quit praying. And sometimes that's the easiest time when life is dark, when life is dismal, there seems to be no answers. You don't know how you're going to get out of the situation. Many times people are tempted to give up and to quit praying. Paul says, no, don't do that. Devote yourselves to prayer. Keep on praying. Be diligent in it. The next word Paul says is, he uses is prayer. Now, the reason I want to focus on this is because if you were like me when I was growing up, prayer was a memorized prayer that you said to kind of gain God's favor. What I didn't realize is prayer is not repeating a bunch of memorized words. Prayer is having a heartfelt conversation with God. Prayer is talking to God and letting God talk to you. And so that's what we need to do in our lives. We need to develop prayer, a conversation with God. Many of us during this time, since we can't get together, will talk on the phone or we will talk through FaceTime or through some, some other uh, modem like Zoom or something like that, or Marco Polo, and, or maybe we will uh, look forward to the day when we can go out to coffee or dinner and we have a conversation with someone again. Do you realize that's what God wants us to do? When you're in that conversation with someone, you're sharing about what's going on, you're sharing about sometimes your hurts, about your problems, about your needs, about your dreams, about your desires, and that's what God wants our conversation to be with him, to, to talk about what's going on in our life. We have an open, honest exchange, and we tell him our dreams and needs and wants. God desires us to talk to him in prayer. The next word I want us to look at is the word alert. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind. The word alert means to keep awake. It was ordinarily used in the context of being on guard being watchful like a soldier who was on duty. And this is the, the picture Paul gives, that as we pray, it's not just us mindlessly saying, God, I need this, that, this, and that, like you're at the, the drive through at Wendy's or Hardee's or wherever it may be, and you're just laying out your order. As you and I are praying, we are watchful, we're alert to our personal lives. God, is there anything going on in my life right now that I need to talk to you about, anything that I need protection in, anything I need to be aware of, any, any challenge, anything I need to up in my life. We observe our marriage, we watch our marriage, our family. 
and, and we let God speak to us and talk to us in this conversation of prayer so that we can then talk to God about the things he's talking to us about. We do it for our workplace. We do it for our school. Students, when you go back to school, whenever that might be, you need to talk to God about your school. We talk to God about our coworkers, about our family, about our friends, about different things going on around us. As we use our prayer time, we're alert and we're watchful. And even as we go throughout the day, we maintain this watchful attitude that the Holy Spirit can prompt us with different situations that we need to pray about. Let's move on. Paul says in verse 3, Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. This verse here tells us that Paul was in prison. He was in chains. Verse 4, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Paul is telling the Colossians right here, when you pray, make sure your prayers have an eternal purpose. So many times it's easy to get focused on our needs, our wants, our desires, but we need to focus on God's needs, God's wants, God's desires. What is God's purpose? Last week we said it was John 3.16. He loves the world so much he gave his only son that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. God wants no one to perish. And Paul says, I want you to pray for me that as I'm here, God's message is going to run. It's going to impact people's lives. Pray for me that as I communicate, I do it clearly so people can understand the gospel message. And God wants you and I to pray for people, to pray for souls, to pray that the gospel spreads. This is an incredible time for us to be praying for the gospel to spread as people are, are missing out on the, the basics of life. They're missing out on money. They're going through stress. Be praying that God shows them their need for him. As people return back to going to work, going to restaurants, going to the bars, I've been praying, God, help them to realize what they thought was going to be fulfilling to them isn't really fulfilling. They'll realize, man, I'm missing something. And it will drive them to God. They will want a spiritual experience. Our prayers need to have an eternal purpose to them. And so as you're praying, pray for family members, co-workers who don't know the Lord. Pray for revival for our nation. As you look in America, we have turned our backs on God. We are wicked, and we need a revival. We need to repent and run back to Jesus. Pray for souls to be saved here in Casper, that as, as our church and other churches open back up, that we'll see more people come in because during this time, they have been longing for something. They realize they need God, and they come to church, and they hear the gospel message. Be praying for your pastor. Pray for me that God would anoint me as I'm preaching for these online services and when we get back for live public gatherings. Pray for our ministries, our ministries to children, to youth. Pray for our food pantry, which every Tuesday we have continued to distribute food. We put food in boxes and give it to families that need food and we try to include something in there that will help them, encourage them, draw them to Christ. Pray that people are drawn to the love of God and come to know him in a real relationship. As you and I are warriors in prayer, as we devote ourselves, we don't quit, and we're alert, we're letting the Holy Spirit show us what's going on so we can pray for that, we can live in victory and experience the real life God wants us to have. And so when we incorporate these three things, Warriors in prayer, we're in the Word of God, and we're worshipers with praise and thanksgiving. That's how we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want you just to reflect and let the Holy Spirit speak to you about these three areas and maybe what you need to grow. Because our intimacy with God, how you get closer to God, it comes from personally engaging God in these three areas. Your intimacy grows as you engage God in worship, the Word, and being a warrior in prayer. So what is God saying to you this morning about 
your life and how you need to engage him. Maybe you're here and God's convicting you, saying, man, you need to uh, develop a heart of thanksgiving. You're not thankful. Maybe you tend to complain, to, to whine, to be negative, to grumble. And God's saying, I want there to be praise and worship in their life. I want there to be a thankful heart. And God wants you to sing and make melodies as you go throughout the day in your own life. Let God develop you. Maybe that's the way you need to engage Him this morning. For others of us, it may be we need to engage God through His Word. We need to see it as not just something to read, but maybe we need to say, God, Jesus, explain it to me and let it burn in me, hot and live. Let it make an impact in me. Let me fall in love with your word. Let it fill your life. You don't need all the Netflix, all the different things in life, but let God's word begin to fill you. Maybe others of you, God is speaking to you about your prayer life and how you need to devote yourself in prayer. Maybe you feel like quitting, giving up. It doesn't do any good to pray. Why should I pray? I'm not seeing any answers. Friends, don't give up. Devote yourselves to prayer and be alert. Let God show you what you need to pray for. If God is speaking to you about one of these areas or more that you need to engage Him more consistently or more diligently, you want to grow in these areas, I want you to say right now, I need to engage God. I need to engage you, God, in worship or the Word or in prayer or maybe all of them. I need to engage you. There's others of you, you're listening this morning, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's like what we were talking about earlier. Maybe you go to church, maybe you have been religious, but you don't have a relationship. You say, Craig, what's the difference between religion and relationship. It's really quite easy. Religion is based upon what you do. Religion's based upon what you do. I, I'm a good person. I do all these good things. I go to church. I believe in God. And you try to do things to gain God's favor, God's love, and God's forgiveness. And you think that, you know, if I do more good things than bad things, if the good outweighs the bad, then I can get into heaven. There's two problems with that. First of all, you don't know how much good you have to do to get in heaven. There is an uncertainty. Have I done enough? And you die without knowing whether you're going to heaven because you don't know how much is enough. How much is enough good to do? The other problem with that is that doing good works does not forgive you of your sin. We're told in Isaiah that all of our righteous deeds, all of our good works are like filthy rags. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. You're saved from your sin by grace through faith. It's not from yourself. It's not of works. It's a gift of God. You see, our works don't wash away our sin. Because if they did, then why did Jesus die on the cross? If you and I could work our way to heaven... If we could stair-step our way up to heaven, then there was absolutely no reason to, for Jesus to die. But you see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin, our sin, separates us from God. And because of that, you and I don't have that relationship, but Jesus took our death penalty. He died. He was sinless. He was perfect. And he died for our sin. And in doing that, you and I, can have a relationship with God if we turn to Him. We need to turn from our sin. We need to acknowledge, God, I have sinned, I've done wrong, and that has caused a separation. I don't have a relationship with you because I've done wrong, and I realize that you have died for me. And we put our faith in Jesus, first of all, to forgive us, but then we also need to put our faith in Jesus for him to lead us and to guide us. Instead of us being in charge of our life and doing what we want to do, we're now letting Jesus become our leader and we're following him. Our lives are going a new direction. We're not following ourselves, we're following Christ. And when you and I trust Jesus to forgive us and to lead us, that's how we receive eternal life and a relationship with God. And you're maybe listening this morning and some of you are saying, you know, I don't have that relationship with God. 
my life is empty. I'm being convicted. I know I've done wrong. I'm not right with God. And if that's you, you can receive God's gift of eternal life. You just have to pray a prayer of repentance and faith, saying, forgive me, God, lead me, and you can have a relationship. And I'm going to, at this time, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you to join me. And when I'm done, I'm going to pray that God will help all of us to grow in our relationship with him. Join me in prayer. Father God, I need a relationship with you. One that is fully alive. One that is active and vibrant. Forgive me, God, of my sin. I'm turning away from it and I'm turning to follow you. I want to engage with you. I want to love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind. I'm giving myself to you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Amen. Now agree with me as I continue to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your great love for us, for dying on the cross. You want to be friends with us. You want a relationship. And I pray that you would help us to engage you. We want to grow. We want to be closer. So help us to be worshipers, oh God. Lord, develop thanksgiving in us. Help us to see what you've done all throughout the day. Forgive us for complaining and being negative and looking at what we don't have instead of what we do have, what you have done for us. Give us a heart of gratitude. May praise flow from our lips. And Lord, help us to hunger for your word. Jesus, explain it to us so that it burns in us. It becomes living and powerful. God, help us to want to read your word. Fill our minds, fill our lives with it. And Father, help us to persevere in prayer. I pray right now you would encourage those people, God, who are going through a tough time. They're struggling. They feel they're in a prison. They feel it's hopeless. They don't see anything happening. God, encourage them today. God, show them you're still with them. God, you're still there in the pit, in the prison. You've been with them the entire time. You've never left them. Help them not to quit. Help them to seek you because if they seek you, they will find you. If they search for you with all of their heart. God, help us to be alert. Help us not to be lazy in prayer, but help us to look for things. Help us to, to hear your voice, for your Holy Spirit to reveal things to us about what we need to pray for. Father, make our relationship with you vibrant as we engage you. And thank you for your awesome, wonderful love. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, God wants to be your friend. He wants a relationship with you that's active and vibrant. So begin to plant seeds of thanksgiving in your life and see a garden, an abundant garden, begin to grow and blossom as you become a worshiper. Fill your heart and mind with the Word of God. L begin to love the Word, hunger for it, and seek God in prayer. And as you and I engage in God, we're going to see our relationship with Him grow more and more. This week, start right now, start today. Be a worshiper, be in the Word, and be a warrior in prayer. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you in just a few moments for a Mother's Day celebration.